everybody, and welcome to the Bear Root Project. I'm your host, David Kearns, with Kearnsy Consulting and Educational Services. Thanks so much for joining me today. Today on the show, we're going to be looking at composting, something that a lot of people understand a little bit about, but I want to make sure that you have a good understanding of it so that you yourself can use this in your backyard, on your acreage, or farm. A little introduction on composting in Canada. It's estimated to cost us about $31 billion in food waste every year. Homeowners are thought to cover about half of that food waste. Production services such as processing, distribution, retail, and food service is thought to cover the other half of that food waste value. That's a lot of cheddar going into landfills. So when this happens, we have food waste going to landfills, and because that material is actually buried, it's going to be locked away from oxygen. This means that it can't decompose, and it's more likely to increase the methane gases that are created in landfills. So how does composting work? Well, composting requires a carefully balanced environment with nitrogen-packed material, carbon materials, and oxygen to offer food to organisms such as bacteria, fungi, insects, invertebrates, and others. Composting can be done on many scales, from a small bin in your backyard to a full-size strip of composting for municipalities or farmers' use. Composting can be done almost anywhere. The most common compost use is by homeowners in gardens with municipality-collected bins which are transported to compost sites. That's exactly what's happening in here in Saskatoon. Alright, so that's the basics. Let's get into it. What kind of system is going to work for you, specifically, right? Despite the type of container you use, there are sometimes important conditions that the composting needs. um, Especially in our climate where we have cooler temperatures along the summer. So these are kind of some of the factors you should consider when trying to decide what kind of container you're going to be using or what kind of system you'll be using. So the first thing we look at is size. Is it large enough to hold, handle all the debris you plan on putting into it? I mean, if you're going to be putting in grass clippings, garden cut downs, you know, branches, things like that, you're going to need a very large space. Whereas if you're only really putting in food scraps, then Most people will get away with, you know, maybe a 10 liter container. So the next thing we want to look at is sturdiness. You know, it, it's got to be able to handle the weight of the debris when it's wet, especially if it's going to be outside. So if you have a rickety wooden fixture that kind of falls apart and you find yourself kind of screwing it back together. And once you load all that material into it, you know, like we're going to need some moisture. So if that weight is too heavy for that container, then maybe we should look at a different system. But sturdiness is also really important. So the next thing we look at is airflow. It's got to allow for airflow and drainage of excess water. I mean, if you don't take care of those two things, then you're going to get a pretty swampy um, anaerobic condition. One of the most important aspects of composting is actually oxygenation. So I'll find even if I walk into some homeowner's backyards, I'll see a brand new compost bin and I'm just kind of looking at it going like, well, it should have a bit more oxygen flow because it's kind of in the corner of your property, right? So airflow is important as well. The next thing we're going to look at is convenience. Uh, it's got to be in a convenient location for you. If you're like me and you're kind of lazy, you don't want to walk out, you know, 30 feet out of your back door during the winter, then you're going to find yourself probably not using it in the winter, which means that you're going to be missing out on a lot of food scraps. The decomposing process may be stopping during the winter, but if you leave a little bit of room for food scraps, that's going to give it a huge increase in in potential organisms that are going to be living in it, right? The more variability um, that you have in your compost bin the more widespread of, you know, decomposers you can support, right? Insects, organisms, all that. So the next thing we want to make sure is that you have some sort of natural surface. So most compost bins will just have an uh, like a bare floor so that when you throw a material in, it's actually hitting, you know, the grass or the soil that's sitting underneath that bin. 
we do this because we need to make sure that the organisms that are responsible for decomposing have access to that material. So as an example, you know, we have like tumble containers that we use for composting. And, you know, if you don't throw a little bit of soil or manure in there at first, then it might be lacking some of the organisms that it needs for speedy decomposition. So like enzymes or organisms and you can buy it by the box it's considered a compost kickstarter so we need some sort of natural surface or if we're using those tumble containers maybe we'll just use a bit of a kickstarter to get it going so the next aspect that we have to look at is how much sunlight is it getting full or part sun is needed so composting requires heat and heat is provided by sunlight this also maintains mold, right? Because, I mean, if we have um, your compost in kind of a shady area, then you're going to have a high mold content, um, which is fine if the spores have lots of air to push that spore creation out of the way so that you're not breathing it in. The other thing that controls that is sunlight, right? So we want to make sure that we're having it in full or part sun. Because that's what we need to make sure that, that that decomposition is going to happen. So what goes into compost? Well, the mixture of debris to be added into a composting pile, it's pretty much dependent on the materials you have at hand. It's recommended to always start your mixture using a two-part carbon, something like wood chips or leaf material, and one-part nitrogen material. This is ideally aiming at having a reasonable odor and minimizing flies, which is one of the reasons that most people don't get into composting. I mean, that's going to happen at first no matter what. But using this mixture, you can kind of see how this mixture works based on your supplies and then just adjust it according to, you know, what, what's happening, right? So how does it work? I kind of look at people's compost bins and I look at it like this. If the pile doesn't heat up, but it smells, you might have too much nitrogen content, too many grass clippings, too many flower stalks, things like that. That means that you have to add more carbon, things like twigs, dried up leaves, you know, that kind of jazz, right? Alternatively, if the pile warms up and it doesn't smell and it's just slowly decomposing, I mean, I'll suggest that you add a bit more nitrogen content. Grass clippings are a great way to add a little bit of uh, nitrogen because as you mix it in it kind of spreads it out nice and evenly so you don't have these pockets of just nitrogen right so the idea is that constantly experimenting with your mixtures will improve your understanding and the quality of the resulting soil I mean mixing it in with sand clay topsoil can help alleviate high nitrogen contents like those found in manure rich contents right composting it's just as much of an art as it is a science. So when it works out and you have a good finished product, take it with pride and throw those hands up and celebrate, even though your neighbor's looking at you like you've lost your mind. You know, in some cases, a stale compost pile can be reinitiated by turning it and maybe mixing in some manure or some enzymes or bacteria cultures to kind of re kickstart that process. If it's really dry, I might suggest just kind of getting it a bit more moist with the hose. That way, It'll kind of help initiate the, the, the environment that we need to have a high decomposition. So that brings us to just general maintenance. So what are the, some of the things that I'm thinking about? Well, keeping the water runoff, and I'm throwing up air quotes here going com compost tea, from going into rivers, ponds, and sewers, it's required to control algae blooms and reduce the strain on our sewer systems, right? So using this compost tea mixed with water, it's actually a great way to utilize this byproduct and further benefit your landscape. I mean, it helps spread those beneficial organisms and nutrients which help create the healthy soils and replaces what naturally happens in the forest for some extent. Cleaning the compost bins periodically, I mean, especially if food waste and high nitrogen materials are kind of going in there for long periods of time, I'm telling you it's essential. Please clean your bins out. Now, again, the runoff can be used in gardens, right? Like the municipally collected green bins, they're notorious for foul smells. I clean mine out regularly, but because I'm always putting 
a little bit of grass clippings that don't make it into my backyard compost. It just always kind of has that stinky smell to it. So turning your compost materials, you know, it's really important to kind of help with that oxygenation, which helps release some of that off gas and it makes the odor stink a little bit less. But one thing, one thing you need to know is that that anaerobic kind of that lack of oxygen compost smells absolutely terrible. So please turn your piles and bins. You know, we're going to do this up to like once per week. This is going to vary depending on the system you're using and what materials you have, right? Um, you can never have too much, much oxygen, but you can definitely have too much methane. So just remember, that's when that's created when like there's a low oxygen condition and things have to decompose in anaerobic situations, right? So that brings us to like watering your compost bin. Um, I know it sounds absolutely nuts, but this will help ensure the decomposition will continue just to keep it moist, not wet. So if you're in an area with like a lot of rain, it may actually require you to protect it so that it's not constantly getting soaked, right? Keeping it locked away from wildlife, that's another big one. Ontario, I'm looking at you right now when I say especially raccoons and other people's pets. If they're getting into your green bin, they can spread any disease that they're carrying and they become reliant on that food source, you know, if it's wildlife or you can, they can actually get sick if it's someone else's pet, right? Uh, the last thing you want is someone's dog mom coming over saying, hey, she ate something gross out of your green bin and it's your fault for, you know, having a hole in your fence, right? So if you're using a high protein material, uh, vegetable waste or even manure, you're most certainly going to have a fly problem, period, especially in the beginning. I mean, you can kind of reduce that. And, and one of the things that we can do, like using insecticides, it's not really that effective. However, um, there's like nematodes and parasites that are registered for fly control. Um, those have offered a lot more natural control because they're living organisms. You can incorporate them into the environment, right? So if the environment that the compost materials are being added to are rich in these natural parasites and predators, the fly population will be controlled to some extent, right? So if you're, say, using um, manure in your compost system and you're getting lots of flies, try offering to the people that you're getting that manure from to treat the st stalls with those parasites so that, you know, the parasites come with the manure, the fly population is going to be drastically lower, right? That's going to bring us pretty much to human health. And this is where the public health announcement comes in. Your health is important. It's important for you to know that the bacteria, the pathogens, and the organisms in your compost can be potentially dangerous to you, right? Mold is especially an issue, like I said before. You know, so turning that pile, you're going to be mixing those spores up into the air. You know, if there's black mold in there, that's no bueno, right? So... Bacteria getting onto your clothes and hands, yeah, also a problem, especially if you're dealing with manure because you're going to be potentially encountering things like E. coli, right? So always wear gloves, wash your hands and face before eating, drinking, or smoking if that's something you do. All right, so the public service announcement part is over. Let's continue. So the finished product should be blackish earth. Sometimes it's recommended to screen it. I mean, especially if you're going to be using it for like commercial sale or if you're going to be giving it to someone, you don't want to give them like a half gnarled chunk of red pepper. Um, so it's like cycling those chunks back into the new piles or systems. It can be a great way to reuse the screenings. If you're using it for your garden, a few minor chunks never really hurt anyone. Like they're going to continue to decompose in your garden right? So if the pile is done, you should be able to stick your elbow deep, like your arm in elbow deep and take a big old clump of dart and smell it. It shouldn't have any odor except for like maybe a little bit of an ammonia smell. If it has a bad odor, it's likely that the proteins and material haven't broken down all the way and further composting time is required. Like this is especially true with manure systems. So another way is a visual inspection. Um, like it should look like soil, right? If you put your arm in a rank pile, you won't be able to get that smell off your arm. So 
if you're worried your pile sure as shit ain't ready. <laughs> Use a stick, right? Uh, once that soil has been harvested, letting it cure for some time will ensure that the mix won't burn the seeds if it's used for germination, right? Because this manure or whatever the the compost is made out of it's going to be high in nutrients right and when seeds are germinating and just taking off they basically just need the parent materials in the soil not so much the high nitrogen or the high phosphorus content when starting a large-scale composting system a windrose system is con commonly adapted because of its ability to keep material compression low and, you know, therefore improve oxygenation, right? Um, in the process, we're going to expose that long heat to more wind, right? So it is best to keep the piles under about five feet in height. Some people go four to limit that compaction because the higher you pile that material, the more weight and more compaction, which kind of squishes the air out, right? So using prevailing winds and row, row direction will definitely benefit you long term from like a larger operation perspective, right? So allowing room for pile turning by either mechanical means or if you're going to be doing it by hand, oh my lord, that would be terrible. Um, you want to you want to do that because it's necessary for controlling the speed and the quality of the decomposition, right? In addition, it can also improve the smell and fly populations for sure when using like that high nitrogen content or manure. So it's, it's a very useful system for large quantities of waste. It's used by municipalities and private composting operations. So if you're interested in kind of creating your own or maybe just giving it to the people around you, um, even if it's just to get rid of that giant pile of manure, you know, finding a way to work this into products that you can give out to people will at least maybe cover some of the cost of getting rid of that manure, that material, right? So on top of all that, controlling the rainwater runoff, like we were talking about before, is really important here. Um, especially if you're planning like any composting pile operation, whether it's small or large, right? Because the storage of the materials is just as important. As an example, like, you know, carbon-rich materials such as, like, wood, that can be stored for a long time. You know, you got a wood pile there, it's going to decompose a little bit for the stuff touching the ground. Maybe it gets a little bit of pathogens in it. But, like, materials like nitrogen-rich uh, materials, manure, all of that stuff will start to decay and smell while attempting to store them. So if you're running maybe a larger operation, it's important to manage when the materials are coming in or how fast you're going to be using them, right? Um, I have a client over in Vanskoy, Saskatchewan. They've got some pretty monstrous piles of manure. And I mean, like, the stories they've told me every time I go out there, they're like, oh, yeah, we lit it on fire again. Because the idea being that we want to actually reduce some of that nutrient content within the manure because it's going to be really high in nitrogen. So it's important to monitor and kind of watch that. So, you know, building these in kind of long uh, rows is really beneficial. You're going to need something like a tractor or a bobcat um, or a skid steer just to go in there and turn those piles because we need that oxygenation. So, you know, keeping an eye on the temperature of the pile, especially the larger, longer ones. Um, you know, in shady areas, it's gonna the temperature is going to be a little bit lower. In sunny areas, the temperature can be a little bit higher. So trying to kind of normalize those piles in those environments is going to help long term and give you a chance just to kind of normalize your product from one side of the pile to another. So again, depending on the materials that you're using and where you're sourcing them, which is ideally as close to your composting operation as possible, all that's going to have a huge impact on what the quality of soil is, you know. I've had people who tell me that their compost has zero seeds in it, and it's because they're baking that compost in the sun, they're getting that temperature up to the right amount, and then they're turning those piles to break those temperatures down again. So depending on how much experience you have, um, you know, you can get some really great product out of, you know, things that we're going to be trying to send to the landfill anyways, right? So that's a little bit about uh, composting in the windrow system. You want to make sure that when you're doing it, you pick your location, 
you know, within reason, you don't want to put it next to a school. It can be a pretty smelly operation, even at the best times. You know, a truck breaks down, you have a load of manure, you got to wait a few days until the truck can be fixed. I mean, that can happen. So taking into consideration how much um, nitrogen and, and, and manure that you have in that is definitely going to help depending on what you want to do with it. And that's basically the introduction of composting, everybody. I want to thank you very much for joining me. If you want to learn more, Kernsey Consulting and Educational Services does have at-home learning modules that you can take um, with you and your family. It's a great way to learn about the environment. We have a composting module that can be done um, weekends, weekdays, whenever it works for you. So if you're interested in that, I'll leave a link in the description. If you have any further concerns, please, I'd love to see a conversation start at the bottom. What was the rankest thing that you've ever smelt when your neighbor tried to compost something? That is definitely something I need to know so that when I'm talking to homeowners, I know exactly what to tell them to avoid, right? So thank you again, everybody, for joining me at the Bear Root Project. I want to thank my listeners and everybody who's helped me get this far as well as, you know, all my resources that I, you know, I have to research some of this stuff too, right? Thank you very much. If you enjoyed this podcast, I encourage you to hit that like button. I'm not going to tell you to smash it because I find that obnoxious, but I really do appreciate any opportunity uh, to spread my information to those who are interested in learning. So if you hit that subscribe button, uh, I'll be able to give you guys more information on continuing subjects. So have an amazing day. Thanks for joining me. Take care. Bye bye. It's in me now.